Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. In 1666, London suffered a devastating fire, which destroyed much of the city. Afterwards, King Charles II went about rebuilding the city, including about 50 churches, all of which were designed by Sir Christopher Wren, the premier architect of the time. No doubt his crowning glory is the Cathedral of St. Paul's in London, with its dome and Greco-Roman facade. Tradition says that on this, the highest hill, in the Roman city of Londinium, there had been a Christian church since 604 AD, replacing a Roman temple. The nature of that church and its 962 AD replacement, destroyed by Vikings, are largely unknown. A medieval church was built starting in 1087 AD and completed in 1240 AD. Things were pretty stable for the Catholic Church for a long time, and then, Well, let's just say after a while the interior was severely damaged by mostly peaceful demonstrations and eventually fell into Protestant hands. In 1561, the spire was struck by lightning and destroyed, prompting Catholics to taunt, told you so, the steeple was never replaced. And in 1666, the rest of the building was severely damaged in the fire. So they had a choice. They could either restore the medieval cathedral or go modern. They chose to go modern, which meant they went Baroque. It was the first cathedral built by the Anglicans since the Reformation. And while some scholars would classify it as English Baroque, I always thought of it as more Renaissance. Perhaps being British, they saw true Baroque and Rococo as just two papists. Or perhaps being British, they liked their Baroque blander like they do their food and building a true Baroque building might have been like putting garlic in their peas porridge. Regardless, the building is an exquisite piece of architecture. It is a masterpiece. Work began a few years after the fire and was topped off in 1708 and officially considered complete in 1711, with interior work on statues continuing into the 1720s. Architect Christopher Wren innovated on the building of a Renaissance dome with a new structural technique, even though it appears to be the same on the outside. Brunelleschi built his dome in Florence as two shells, with a horizontal ribbed masonry system that subtly staggered its way from the pre-existing octagon base upward and inward without scaffolding. Michelangelo's dome for St. Peter's was also a masonry double shell. Both those domes employed the idea that a dome was a round arch rotated 360 degrees. The double shell lightens the load while acting like the top and bottom cords of a truss, strengthening the structure. At St. Paul's, Wren introduces something different. There is still the double shell dome. The inner dome on the inside works proportionally with the space on the inside, and the outer dome on the outside helps establish the presence of the dome from far away and is much higher. The outer dome with its circle of columns is an innovation stylistically, going beyond Michelangelo's engaged pilasters on his dome. Overall, the design is typical for a double dome masonry technique, but in Wren's design, there is a third dome of sorts, that masonry cone that's in between, and that cone employed the idea of a parabola rotated 360 degrees. The parabola is a more efficient means of delivering the compressive loads of an arch to the ground, reducing lateral thrust. This cone does most of the heavy lifting. The dome itself reaches 360 feet above the ground and is 101 feet in diameter, making it one of the largest masonry domes in the world today. If you look at the facade of St. Paul's Wall, it looks mostly Renaissance, with its use of windows, columns, and pediments. There's enough of a curve on the side facades to push it into the Baroque period, and the two towers look very much like the lanterns of the towers of many Baroque churches in Rome. 
but I still find the facade to be less about the captured motion Baroque employs and more tranquil. This and the use of white inside and outside reminds me of the Pinnacle Renaissance churches, in my opinion, by Palladio in Venice, both Il Redentore and San Giorgio Maggiore. See Architecture Codex video number 48 for more about Palladio and the core beliefs of Greco-Roman design. What I like about these two Venetian churches is how Palladio has transformed Greek orders and Greek proportions into a larger basilica-based facade by overlapping two or more Greek temple fronts. Even though the Greeks and Romans might never have imagined or even approved of such a design, these facades capture the tranquil spirit of nature-based proportions, and I would not be surprised to find many a golden section rectangle in the design. Inside and out, they also glory in the natural white and gray color of local Carrera marbles, which allows the deep shadows of the richly carved building elements to pop boldly, yet tranquilly. Looking back at Wren's west facade, the main entrance, I see two Greek temple facades combined. In this case, above is the end of the Greek temple, with its triangular pediment that would normally follow the slope of the roof. It is detached from that roof in order to create order on this flat facade, much like Palladio's design. Wren puts this temple front on top of the side facade of a Greek temple, with its linear architrave being the visual and structural support of the temple end above. And yet Wren creates spaces between pairs of columns to create portals for natural light to enter. Innovative, and yet it still reads as authentic Greek. This is flanked on each side by towers that follow the Renaissance order of floors. See Michelangelo's Palazzo Farnese. The base is rusticated, sort of, with arches, and the second level is refined with the unbroken triangular pediment of classical orders. But above, the pinnacles start getting Baroque, with segmented round temple elements and exaggerated stone scrolls on the lantern. The facade has proportion and hierarchy, and works with the language and grammar of the greatest Greco-Roman buildings ever built. Maybe you can trace a transition from Val de Grasse in Paris, which Wren would have seen under construction, but I still think Wren's facade is substantially different, creative, and beautiful. But it seems that once again Wren was guided almost exclusively by books of printed engravings of classical architecture. Inside the nave is very white, with a bit more gold gilding than Palladio's churches. I too found this soothingly calm, particularly during a winter's dusk, as the natural light is soft and gentle. The wood of the choir and the heavily frescoed ceiling add more warm color, but they accent the whiteness of the architecture well. The fresco under the dome uses forced perspective, trompe l'eau, to visually extend the interior, as if the masonry cone was invisible and you could see the underside of the top dome. So how did Christopher Wren, with so little practical architectural experience, achieve so quickly such a masterpiece design? His early life was very typical for a scholarly political family without royal blood. Caught in the middle of the conflict between the Royalists and the Puritans, the family lay low for many years. Wren demonstrated an ability to draw and master math. He had a classical education at Wadham College in Oxford and landed a teaching position in London and then an appointment to the Royal Society, a scientific body. Wren focused primarily on astronomy. It is obvious that Christopher Wren's path to being an architect would be academic and not as a tradesman laborer, which had been the tradition for many thousands of years. And it was not uncommon at this time for the educated gentleman to perceive architecture as an automatic skill endowed with his education. I run across that all the time today. People with advanced degrees tell me how they really should have been an architect. Anyway, with the death of architect and artist Indigo Jones in 1652, England was lacking a dominant architecture personality, and so the time was right for Sir Christopher Wren. Wren's first commission, indeed his first attempt at architecture, was in 1663 at the age of 31. A commission from his uncle Bishop Matthew Wren for the Pembroke Chapel. It's good to know people in powerful places. 
A little later, Wren was awarded the commission to design the Sheldonian Theater in Oxford. According to Wren's son, the design was based on a 16th century engraving of the Theater of Marcellus in Rome. Just two years later, he got the commission to redesign the old St. Paul's from King Charles II. That year, 1665, he went to Paris to study architecture, which was a pretty good idea since he was already practicing as an architect. This presumably was at the new École des Beaux-Arts. King Louis XIV had determined that Paris, the largest city in Europe at the time, should become the new Rome and sought out Italian artists and architects to help him build it. But those same imports would also train Frenchmen to become artists and architects in the Roman tradition. Christopher Wren went along for the ride. Today, most architects need at least eight years of schooling, apprenticeship, and then rigid exams before they can claim the title of architect. Wren went from his first designs to some schooling and then the commission to design the most important cathedral in all of London in just four years. In Paris, Wren met G. Lorenzo Bernini, the great and scandalous Baroque Italian architect and sculptor who had been commissioned by Louis XIV to design a new facade for the Louvre. His designs were unbuilt and Bernini quickly left Paris that fall. But Wren was so impressed with Bernini's designs, he is reported to have said, quote, I would have given my skin for, end quote. Wren studied in Paris for less than two years, but apparently got to see much of the neoclassical architecture already built there and acquire quite a library. Wren returned to England just in time for the London fire. Christopher Wren oversaw an office of people who presumably brought their practical building experience to projects and expanded his capacities, as the cathedral and the other churches were an immense undertaking. Wren started the design of the new cathedral in 1670, but ultimately it seemed too modest, and the design and the models increased in grandeur through multiple iterations until the final design. They became less central Byzantine and more longitudinal Latin in their floor plans. Wren's final design was the sophisticated reinterpretation of Greco-Roman elements we see today. But something made Wren restrain himself so the cathedral was not fecund with overwrought French Renaissance detailing that would have defined the court of Louis XIV. It demonstrated the architect's familiarity with classical design and ease with transforming it to some other purpose. This is not taught. This is innate. This is genius. This is talent. The equally talented Palladio at least had the advantage of recently discovered books by Vitruvius, an ancient Roman architect, and having seen the ruins and buildings in the city of Rome up close for his genius inspirations. But from what I can determine, Christopher Wren never got to Italy, so he never saw Rome or even Venice to see Palladio's work in person. I might presume then that like the engraving he studied for the theater, he had the benefit of both Vitruvius's and Palladio's books to learn about classical architecture. Still, it required incredible and innate design talent to execute the facade design and the construction of St. Paul's using 18th century printed books as inspiration. What we are seeing then is the manifestation of the modern Renaissance philosophy and thinking at the time, that people were called to understand everything about all things. Men like Wren, Bernini, Palladio, Michelangelo, Brunelleschi, and others were skilled in all forms of science and art. They were sculptors, poets, authors, painters, astronomers, engineers, biologists, mathematicians, and architects. They were Renaissance men. I always wanted to be a Renaissance man, but when I opened up the New York Times Help Wanted section and looked under R, there were no listings. So I figured I'd better specialize. This is no doubt at least partially inspired by Vitruvius in his book when he wrote, quote, the ideal architect should be a man of letters, a skillful draftsman, a mathematician, familiar with historical studies, a diligent student of philosophy, 
acquainted with music, not ignorant of medicine, learned in the responses of Jewish consults, familiar with astronomy and astronomical calculations." End quote. A similar statement, almost 2,000 years later, and a personal inspiration to me, comes from the modern science fiction writer Robert Heinlein, who, unlike Vitruvius, does not limit his call to greatness to just men. Quote, a human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects." End quote. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex. Thank you.